And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, and welcome to a new month of And Now for Something Completely Machinima. I'm joined by Tracy Harwood, Ricky Grove, and Hello. Phil Rice. All right, so uh, I'm going to start with May the 4th be with you, because two days from now is the 4th of May, which is Star Wars Day. And um, I've chosen a Star Wars film to go alongside that. Oh, um, my God, you're <gasps> kidding. Yes. You chose a Star Wars film? That's so out of character for you. I know. I thought I really need to surprise everyone. I'm glad that this occasion came around, Damien, for you, so that you had a chance to finally pick a, a Star Wars related movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, it actually has been a while since I've chosen one. Oh, was it, it last month? Hang on. It was has. it last month? <laughs> well, I've got a secret stash. I just. Uh -huh. There you go. Under a blanket, my phone watching. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's called Star Wars 8080 Walkers. And it's. It's kind of like a film footage from a nature documentary. And they've filmed these. Imperial walkers walking along, but they've done it like their wildlife. Like elef you know, you see a, a nature documentary of elephants, a herd of elephants going along. It's like that. And they're going through all these different environments. And, you know, it starts off, they're acting like you'd expect from Star Wars, but then they start doing things like scratching their legs or looking at water. There's a scene where they're asleep, <laughs> which is like. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought that was very funny. <laughs> uh, and as soon as they got to that bit, I thought. I know I haven't picked anything Star Wars for a while. I've been trying to do other things, but this is so good that I had to do it because it's just so different from what you expect a Star Wars yeah. uh, mission. To who's, the, who's the director? Jeremy Cummins. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy Cummins. Um, I can't say I'm familiar with any of his other work, but uh, I, I really like this. And I'm looking at now, he hasn't actually done that much else. He's done a couple of... Um, he did Pie in the video. Sky, which was another short film. Yeah. And then he also did a, 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 tra a kind of a, a resume film. Yeah. A, a reel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what I've seen in this uh, Star Wars video, it's very impressive work. Yeah. So I do need to check out Pie in the Sky. I... But yeah, that's why I chose it. It's, it's fun, it's really well done, and it was perfect for May the 4th. So uh, what do you guys think? Shall I start? Because I have done a bit of digging. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, let's start with Jeremy, shall we? Um, he actually has a specialist um, professional career as a, as a character animator. He's In fact, he's got almost 20 years of career at a bunch of animation and special effects studios. Um, before he lands at Sony Pictures Imageworks in 2017, and then after a couple of other career moves, worked as an animator for Industrial Light and Magic between 2021 and 2023. And he is currently the senior animator at Tippett Studio. Mm. Yeah. He's got credits on films like Ant-Man and the Wasp, Matilda, Spider-Man and Avengers, among others. So uh, this is another film by an industry professional, clearly working on developing an unreal pipeline to see where he can place his own character animation making expertise. Um, actually, I love that these guys do this um, because unless you do the sort of digging that I do, you're never going to know this. Um, but I like to sort of, as you know, try and figure out where he's come from. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I quite like the way that they kind of produce these really interesting experimental um shorts um and then put them out there in their in their own right um i know they're testing and developing their own kind of workflow um i was going to say this guy doesn't seem to have a direct link to star wars the you know the films um and of course he hasn't shared the part of 
uh, the Tippett Studio portfolio that he's been working on. However, Tippett Studio projects do include the Book of Boba Fett, The Mandalorian, and other mm. films in the in the franchise. And as well, they include um, films like, as you'll know, uh, Jurassic Park and, and various um, films in that franchise, and also Starship Troopers and Mad God. <laughs> so it's probably f- fair to say there is kind of a connection somewhere on this one, although I couldn't find anything specific mm-hmm. beyond what I've kind of um, found out. Um, I think what's interesting specifically here, um, and particularly with the timing on this one, is that you'll probably, um, Ricky, you'll probably know this, um, Tippett Studio was recently acquired by an Indian special effects company called Phantom Effects, which is bound to realise some changes, um, not least because um, their MD has said that their, you know, their, their aim with the combined expertise of Tippett is to um, revolutionise what they describe as the uh, VFX industry, particularly focusing on on uh, the Hollywood set, but they, their goal is worldwide. Um, so I would imagine there's a bit of um, underground development going on and this guy is trying to sort of um, set the scene for whatever his next role might be within this kind of changing landscape. And we mm. already know that there are a lot of guys working on Unreal, who are professionals. In fact, some of the films we've got this month are are indeed professionals putting themselves out there as indies, um, testing out the the, the Unreal workflow in, in, in many ways. Do you want me to talk about film a bit as well? Um, sure. You know, obviously it's made... You seem in- to be doing just fine. You don't have to ask us. Yeah. <laughs> just roll away, baby. Sure. <laughs> okay, well, he's used Unreal 5.3 and a bespoke rig that he's made. And obviously that's come from his his uh, you know professional work. Um and he's obviously got access to some brilliant um sound effects for the machinery. I think the sound effects are what just drew me in on this one straight away. I love the overall aesthetic for this. Um, um you know, it's it's kind of it's not really a, a side of the the attacks that I I actually remember in the Star Wars films. I also really loved the 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 reference to um, Attenborough's planetary ecosystem documentaries. Um, yes. <laughs> you know that I thought that was that was that was inspired, and and obviously it's got that kind of subtitle migration. <laughs> Although what you've got here, I think, isn't migration across the savannah as you would in an Attenborough, Attenborough film, but, um, you know, it's it's migration across a planet. So you saw, for example, open plains Africa type, and then you saw the steppes regions of Asia, say, and possibly you also saw an attempt to sort of portray the character through the eons of time as well, um, because you know, these machines wouldn't have a, a life cycle like an, a living animal, one would assume. I don't know. I thought there were I thought there were more than more than one type of reference to um you know, sort of the passing of time and and a natural kind of environment. Well and and, and with the migration term also, I think there was the double or triple meaning yeah. uh of of you know what's going on mechanically here. He developed these assets in Maya. And now he's he's brought them into uh, Unreal Engine, so there was that, that's yes. that's a migration as well. Yeah, I'm that's sure a, he was conscious of that. I, I think you're right. I think there was a lot going on here that's kind of hidden in this. Um, I thought the lighting effects were they were really unexpected. I mean, the the atmosphere on the on the of the of the plains and the mountains and that sort of sense of passing time and the weather and the times of day. I thought it was absolutely stunning. Um, it's like these machines are being portrayed as as being at home in their natural habitat. That they and the fact that they slept, <laughs> argued, and were itchy and a bit goofy <laughs> at times. I thought that was just such such a fun thing to do. And then among all that kind of clanking, um, which I which I thought, I mean, I watched it a couple of times. The editing was absolutely spot on. In terms of the the you know the the sound and the movement, I thought it was incredibly well done. There was a point quite early in that video where I actually thought 
I, I really felt as the viewer of it, I was curled up in a hide watching them. And, and at one point I thought, oh my God, it's got you spotted because it actually sort of seemed to kind of look at you. I thought it was, it was brilliant. How can you imagine sort of being faced by a, a you know, a unit like that uh, out in the wild, what on earth would you do? Um, and then quite apart from the machinery sounds, which I thought at times are a bit tank-like, um, the, the, the criticism I've got really is that some of the animal sounds didn't make quite so much sense to me. And that's because you recognise the first sort of sounds that they make, apart from the clanking noises, as being cows, maybe of the kind of Texan longhorn type. Um, so these kind of attacks do appear to be a little bit behaviorally like a, a cow or maybe an elephant, as you said, Damien. Um, but later on, the sounds were not what you would expect a cow to make. They were kind of more reminiscent of big cats. And at time, I also thought, hmm, that sounds a little bit like a predatory dino from Jurassic Park, too. So I kind of picked those. And I, and I have to say, I it's a good to that. ear, Tracy. One one of the sounds, because uh, I recognize it from a, a well-known commercial library, one of the sounds is actually an alligator growl. Oh, OK. Hmm. Okay. So it gave it definitely it it does have a big cat sound, but it's also a little more guttural. So it has a yeah. reptilian reptilian right. implications to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you know I've I've spent town time out on the African savanna, so I was thinking maybe what they were you know with the cow sort of thing, maybe what they were trying to go for was maybe the buffalo, which frankly are some of the most aggressive critters you can actually come across out on that. Mm -hmm on the in the bush and whatnot and i thought maybe that's what he was aiming for you know because they do make sounds a little bit like that maybe maybe a bit more guttural grunting than than mooing but that that bit that whole kind of sounds bit just broke me out of it a little bit um although i thought you know the portrayal of them as cows generally was really quite <laughs> quite funny um, and I also loved the feedback from a couple of folks on the on the uh, on the chat as well. One of them said, "It's so rare to see the wild atat in its natural habitat, untouched by man's hand. Now, if only we could capture the birth of these majestic creatures, that would really be something." <laughs> and then another one commented in return, "I think uh, Galactic Geographic has an exclusive holovid of a wild atat birth, but it's behind a paywall." <laughs> And then there was a really another another really funny comment which made me laugh, which was, I "Love how their knee joints sound like my uncle dropping his bag of spanners," <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was great. <laughs> so overall, I have to say this is one of the best Star Wars films I've actually seen. It, I mean, what a great way to celebrate May the Fourth and all that. Um, I think it's 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 yet more testament to just how creative folks can get with the Unreal tool set. I think this guy's done an amazing job with this, irrespective of the fact that we know he's a professional, which really, to me, just means the bar is raised for him. <laughs> um, and one would expect it to be good, but it's, this is really good. Um, and I guess what we might expect, given what I said about this studio, this Tippett Studio takeover business, I guess we might see more people attempting to play with the IP uh, in uh, novel ways, given the kinds of comments that are coming out from hmm. um, that particular studio that's taken them over. So loved it. Thank you very much. The problem with you going first uh, is that all of my notes are just useless <laughs> now. <laughs> Sorry. Because you're such detailed and cogent and intelligent observations. There's little for me to add. You know, so thanks a lot for that, Tracy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, several things that are, are I can say that you didn't say was that um, surprisingly, there's a there's a kind of tenderness and humor in the film that is surprising, considering the fact that these are death dealing machines in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> The humor of turning that on its head, I think, was was very very funny. Uh, I love the the design of everything. Obviously, he's a pro and, and is gifted in that. Although I think because he's so focused on animation and the cinematography, he's less skilled at sound 
because there were many problems with the sound, as you pointed out some of them. Others were, why wasn't there sounds, ambient environmental sounds at, uh, at the time? Um, there could have been interesting sounds when the at with a ATATs were nuzzling each other, or sort of character like sounds that reflected the type of anthropomorphism that they were doing. Which whether they're he thought they were elephants or he thought they were, you know, big uh, cows or dogs or whatever it was, he needed to spend more time on sound basically and be more creative with it because it would have added an element of believability of. Uh, what's that word um verisimilitude to the to the scene that would have made it even better uh although you know he probably did this in a short amount of time and was focused on getting it up if that's the case i thought it was just marvelous it, it, you're right it is one of the better uh, star wars films however i have to say the other short film that he had in his youtube channel was called pie in the sky and it was a robot pizza delivery uh, uh, robot who suddenly decides to go off programming and have fun with all the pizzas. <laughs> it, and, and that, I think, was a better film because it had a, more engagement. I mean, once you saw the AT-ATs and what was going on, the film was over, essentially, in terms of plot in... 30 seconds, a minute. And although it was enjoyable to watch the develop and everything, and I like the parody and the satire of it, the pie in the sky had much more involvement as far as characters, because eventually the pizza box that he sort of threw away has an alarm that goes off that says, you're, you're not delivering the pizza, you're not delivering the pizza. And of course, the robot freaks and runs all over the place. So there's a, there's a character thing that appealed to me more. And it was done with the same um, technique of creation in Maya and then porting to uh, Unreal. And, and the environmental work in that was just as effective. So I would recommend, and it's a short one too, it's like four or five minutes. Uh, I would recommend Pie in the Sky as well. It'll just take you a little extra to watch. So it's a great, he's a very interesting filmmaker and I like him a lot. But then again, being a pro like that, you'd expect a high level of quality to it. Mm. Yeah, I think what what captured me uh, about this this film was it kind of, it taps into, I think, a magical movie moment, mm. which was... And it, and I remember very fondly because as a kid who was a Star Wars fan, the first reveal of these, we used to call them ADATs before the internet. I don't know if that was common or not. Nobody knew how they were supposed to be pronounced. Uh, I think it's probably more correct to say it the way Damien did, where you just spell out the letters. But we called them ADAT walkers. Uh, the first time that they're revealed on screen is one of the one of several absolutely magical movie moments in The Empire Strikes Back, which is, you know, for for my money, the best Star Wars movie that's ever been made, uh, dramatically and otherwise. But the first time that they're revealed, it's just this, this fascinating, these animal-like mechanical creatures. They're seen, I think, first, they're first seen through the binoculars, right? Far off, and then they get closer, mm. and then... And there was mm -hmm. always this anthropomorphic sensation about them, even though they were clearly machines. Um, and th this is kind of leaning into that feeling about these walkers, uh, that they have animal-like qualities. I think they were designed with that in mind, to to play with that in our in our minds. I think if it was just... If that scene played out where the invasion of of Hoth was just really large ships, it, it wouldn't have been nearly as impactful as these strange machines we had never seen before. Um, so that I, I kind of feel like I, I don't know what the age of this filmmaker is. Um, if I had to guess with the, with the kind of experience and resume he's got, he's probably you know somewhere around my age or or, or Damien's age. You know it that he he had some of the childhood 
uh, fascination with these things in Star Wars. And he's, yeah, he's, yeah. This is a chance to kind of bring that to life and, and really lean into the animal aspect of it. So, uh, to me, that's a lot of what makes this effective is the, that kind of history that it's leaning on. Um, you know, the sound, it, it's not perfect. Um, there there's, he's clearly got access to a nice library of the actual ad at sounds because you can hear them. You can, you can recognize them. If you, um, if, if you've paid, if you've paid attention to star Wars, there's a certain, there are certain sounds that are just unmistakable. And yeah, he tried with, I think, limited success to mix in real animal noises. And I, and I like the intent behind that. I just don't think that it ended up being executed mm -hmm. terribly well. Um, there's, there are techniques that are used that have been used quite successfully in films over the years where you may have a large mechanical thing. Um, it doesn't even have to be, you know, personified at all, but just this large mechanical thing looming and there will be like a, a metallic groan that will happen that right, it sounds right. like just the sound of large metal but it resembles a little bit like the moan of a big animal or something. And it's just, it's a really effective thing. It's almost become cliche. It's been done so many times in so many different movies, but it's still effective. Like it, it's, it's a neat sound to hear that just for a moment, it, 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 it sends it, this it, weird message of this thing's alive, even though, you know, it's not. Also that it's immense, that it's huge. Right. Right. Yeah, to, it's it's such a strange thing to think of communicating size with sound, but it absolutely yeah. can be done. And um, and so that's what he was that's what he was, I think, endeavoring toward here. Um, and you know, he wanted to give them a little bit more of a biological aspect. So, yeah, a, a real animal sound library makes sense. Um, but I think that his his skills clearly are. Uh, uh, he's invested his skill set in, in, uh, in the visuals and the animation and that kind of thing. And, and we've talked about this many times before in the show that, you know, somebody finding somebody who is a master of all those things is pretty rare. You know, people, yeah. people are strong in one thing and maybe not as strong in the other. So, um, but no, I, I, I enjoyed it. I feel like it ran a little long for what it was. I think Ricky is spot on that if there'd been, you know, something, something of a narrative, something to kind of move things forward or give a different point of view or something. Um, and I don't know exactly how that would be done, but I just know that it was missing, you know, um, that that would have made the length more appropriate. Um, but uh, I don't think that that was his objective from, from what I can tell. Yeah. 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 Me neither. And, and from the point of view of someone who like this person who has worked in traditional film, this is very short, right? Yeah, we're yeah, coming yeah, yeah. at it from the world of short film, and this feels a little long. And it, it, if he's here, if he would hear us say that, he'd probably laugh and think, "What? This yeah. is like as short as you can get. It's almost just a trailer length, you know." But you know, that's that's just that's. I think that's just the perspective of, you know, what we've spent years yeah. absorbing as content and looking at and stuff. So yeah, for me, it was a little bit long, but. Uh, it was it was well executed and it did it, it tied in uh you know kind of brought in these senses of the attenborough nature doc documentaries and of course leaning on that star wars history about these mysterious uh i want to call them creatures they're not of course they are they're just they're, <laughs> they're just they're death dealing machines. machines that's right yes, that's right uh, but yeah if, you know i think Many, many, many fans of the Star Wars universe uh, at various levels. There's always a little bit of excitement when you the few times in the canon movies that you do get to see these things again, you know, because yeah, yeah. it was like so many things in Lucas's original Star Wars movies. Uh, it seems like so many times the the coolest things or the coolest characters too. You only get like just the briefest little time with, you know, think about Boba Fett before yeah, yeah. before it was turned into this whole thing. And he's got a race and the, the Mandalorian and all that stuff blown up in the original movies is like, just 
tiny little screen time. Tiny little guy, bit, yeah. And everybody yeah. was fascinated with him. And they issued a special edition Star Wars figure for this this guy that has two lines and and is just, you know, Darth Maul is another one. Just one of the coolest looking guys and just, you know, all acrobatic with his swords. And he's, whoop, there he is, and he's dead. You know, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Lucas loves doing that. And with the ad ads too, it's just, we see him for a 20 minute scene. I think it was, if, if that, and then that's it. I think what, maybe there was one in the Ewok forest, Damien, you'd, you'd, you'd know, maybe, yeah, I know they had the two legged ones. Maybe there was, there was some at a distance on, on, uh, there on was the one Vendor. very, there was one of these very briefly and you kind of wonder how did it get between all the trees? Yeah. It was like an <laughs> establishing right. shot almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, you know, anyone who, who loves, uh, I think that these, made an appearance in Rogue One as well um, yeah. in in that final battle there. So, uh, yeah, so to get a little just time devoted to those, uh, it's it's appreciated, even even if it, you know, wasn't perfect and probably wasn't intended to be, uh, you know, yeah. a standalone piece of entertainment. Given, given the story behind this yeah. and what he was trying to do. It's almost uh, a proof of concept film right, in a way. Right, right. Right. So the fact that it even reached for, even unintentionally, these things that we're now criticizing, you know, these lenses we're criticizing it through is is an achievement, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was uh yeah. it was enjoyable. It's a perfect it. representation of real time cinema today, made in Unreal. I mean, yeah. it, it shows you exactly the kind of quality that you can uh, create, the kind of impact that it can have, even though the it was short. Although the skill level is pretty, you have to be pretty high level skills to to be able to create that. Because even despite the fact that Unreal is fairly clear in terms of its workflow, it's not something that amateurs can jump right in and, and yeah. grab. Not not and get these kind of results, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. Great pick. So really enjoyed it. Well, I'm glad all of you enjoyed it. Um, so. Uh... I think we're going to wrap that up for this episode. So uh, let us know what you think of this film. Uh, be sure to check out uh, Pie in the Sky as well. I know I need to watch that as well after we finish recording. It's good. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you have any feedback or you want to contact us for anything else, please uh, send us an email at talk at completelymachinima.com. And we'll be back next week. Take care and may the fourth be with you. And may the fourth be with you. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>